Merciful Father in heaven, this morning we come to the communion table and we ask for your divine mercy, intervention, in granting us a deeper, a deeper presence of your Holy Spirit so that we might have the spiritual discernment and insight as to the deeper significance of your tremendous sacrifice and what it all means to us. Help us, Lord, to experience it deep within our fibers. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In the middle of the 1900s, Dr. Weiler Penfield, a neurosurgeon at the Montreal Neurological Institute in Canada, was treating epileptic patients. Now, mind you, he is a surgeon, and he's treating epileptic patients. And how he treated these epileptic patients was he would go into the brain and he would destroy the areas where the seizure, seizure activities were occurring. And, and this was most unusual at the time, but he was doing research. Before he would determine which areas of the brain he was going to destroy, he had to map out the areas of the brain with their function, their motor, their sensory function. And he would map them out by putting little electrical probes on the brain. Now the brain does not have any pain sensations. And the patients were conscious. They were awake and aware. They just had topical anesthesia. And they were awake, and he would stimulate the electrical probe, and the patient would then tell him what he was experiencing. And it was so vivid to the patient that they would say that they were reliving these experiences. And they would describe it to him. Now, Dr. Weiler Penfield was a very curious uh, surgeon. And he was also not only searching and mapping out the different areas and functions of the brain, but he wanted to find out where the human soul was located. And that's one of the things that he was searching for intensely. He wanted to find out. Because the Greek philosophers have been saying that the soul was immortal and it's in man. And he wanted to find out where it was located. He never did find where the immortal soul was located, but he did discover by happen chance that everything that you have ever experienced, everything that you've ever seen, everything that you've ever heard, everything that you have ever sensory experience is registered and engraved in your mind. Whether it be in the unconscious, subconscious, or conscious levels of your mind, it's all registered. It's all registered. Now, that explains a phenomena that will occur at the end of the millennium. At the end of the millennium, the wicked will be resurrected. They will surround the holy city as if to attack it. And inspiration tells us 
in their minds, they will see and experience a panoramic review of their life. Their whole life will flash before them, and they'll see, they'll see opportunities that they had that they have neglected, and they'll see that God is just, that God is good. Now, the question is, if everything, everything, everything is engraved in your mind, how do you get, let's say, the lower, deeper levels, unconscious, subconscious, how do you get these experiences to surface to consciousness? How do you get them to be in your mind, dominantly in your thought patterns? Well, there's an old, old statement that I remember. to do righteous acts because we gravitate to our more dominant thoughts and we are transformed by beholding. If you look in your bulletin, you will notice in the very back a statement from Desire of Ages, page 83. In this statement, Inspiration tells us that many times there are many people that attend religious services. Like now, we're attending a religious service. And we get a blessing. We feel refreshed, we feel comforted, and, and we, we feel uplifted because of the fellowship, because of the music, because of the spiritual environment. But then we go home. And when we leave, she makes the statement, but through neglect of what? Meditation. Through neglect of meditation. Watchfulness and prayer, we lose that blessing. In other words, whatever we experience, it's a superficial experience. 
Meditation takes the superficial and internalizes it and engraves it deep, deep, deep into our fibers. And then she recommends it would be well. She says it would be well for us to spend a thoughtful, that's meditation, a thoughtful meditation hour each day in contemplation. We should take it point by point and let the imagination, let the imagination, the sanctified imagination, take you to the throne of God. Amen. That's why every time we start our worship, I encourage you, use your sanctified imagination. Now, I'm going to say something that perhaps some might misunderstand. It's not good enough just to read your Bible and skim over it. It's not good enough to say a quick prayer. No, no, no. If you want this to be deeply engraved, you've got to meditate, internalize, spend time absorbing it absorbing it, absorbing it, and make it a part of your fiber. you got to spend time thinking about it, using your sanctified imagination, letting it, letting it just go. But stick to the Bible. Stick to the truth. And then I want you to notice the results. As we thus dwell upon this great sacrifice that Christ made for us, our confidence... Faith will be more constant. It's not going to be on and off. It's going to be consistent and constant. Amen. It says our love will be quickened. Our love will be revived. It will be dynamic. It will be alive. And then it says, and we shall more deeply be imbued with the Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit, the latter rain. And that's the only thing the only thing that's going to finish the work. It's not money. It's not organization. It's not programs. It's the outpouring of the latter rain. Amen. And you get that by bonding, by spending time. And the end result, the final result, is that by beholding that character, we will be changed into his image, his glory. We will be like him in character. Now that's a gold that I really want. But now you take a look. The concept is, the concept is to spend time just meditating, meditating. And she says, especially the closing scenes of his life. Now, if you want to see what happens to people when they meditate, all you have to do is look at the apostles. Look at the early church. They turned the world upside down. They were fearless. They were willing to die. It didn't mean anything because they were in love with Christ. Now, when you stop to think about the life of Christ, and you stop to think about thinking about Christ, Christ lived for 33 and a half years. That is 12,227 days. Now, if you deduct 30 of those and just deal with his public ministry, that's three and a half years. That is 1,277 days. So let's just deal with the smaller portion. Let's just deal with the 1,277 days. That is his public 
ministry. Let's just deal with that. We're not going to go. We're not going to go to the 12,227, 33 and a half years, his whole life. We're just going to deal with the small portion. All right? If you were to take the Gospels, analyze them closely. Matthew has 28 chapters. 28 chapters. The last seven days of Christ's life. Seven days of his life. When he enters Jerusalem, when he is crucified, when he is resurrected, the last seven days are found in chapters 21 through 28. That's seven chapters. That is one-fourth, one-fourth of the Gospel of Matthew focuses predominantly on those last days. Mark has 16 chapters. The last seven days is from chapter 10, verse 42, to chapter 16. That's a third, a third. Now Luke, he has 24 chapters. He starts out chapter 19, verse 28, to chapter 24. That's only five, so that's about a fifth. That's the shortest. A fifth is the smallest amount. But then the Gospel of John has 21 chapters. And starting in chapter 10, verse 22, to chapter 21, you have 11 chapters. That's almost half. Now, it's interesting that John only deals with 21 days of the life of Christ. Only 21 days. And the three and a half years is 1,277. No wonder, no wonder John says that there were many, many other things that could be said about Christ. That if it were written, there wouldn't be enough books to contain it. No wonder. But now, let's go back into the process of meditation. Why is it so important to meditate and to think? Well, Ellen White makes the statement, and she makes this in numerous places. It's found 12 times in her writings. Volume two of the Testimonies, Councils to the Churches, Councils on Health, the book Education, Temperance, and so on. She makes this statement. The brain nerves, the brain nerves, that's the central nervous system, central nervous system, brain, spinal column, which communicates with the entire system is the only, only medium through which heaven can communicate to man and affect his innermost life. Only the central nervous system is the only place that the Holy Spirit can work. The tr-
re-experiencing, reliving, engraving deeper into our fibers the image of God.